All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. This has been uh, just an awesome month. Every February, we kick all the men out for the month. We host Women in Science, Exploration, Adventure, and Conservation. We have been all over the world this month. We've hosted over 40 events for classrooms. We had our first ever Women Blaze Trails Festival for the general public with another 50 speakers uh, taking part over a weekend. It has been a ton of fun. I can't believe there's only two uh, days left in February. However, we do still have lots of events. I think another four or five events to go before uh, the month ends. So if you do head to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find all of those events uh, and join in there. Okay, well, again, today is another one of our fun events. We are connecting with the crew at Hearts in the Ice. So in 2019, 2020, Sonova Sorby and Hilda Strom made history uh, when they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. They spent 12 months at the remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu, located at 78 degrees north and 140 kilometers from the closest town of Longyearbyen uh, in Svalbard. So climate change is definitely not taking a break, so neither are they. They return to Svalbard in November, and they will be overwintering at Bumsabu until May 2021. So together with a team of 10 global partners, Hearts in the Ice is acting as a bridge between science, uh, and global citizens so we can better understand climate change and what we all need to do uh, to play a role. They will continue to serve as citizen scientists on a variety of projects from observing clouds and auroras to flying drones to monitoring ice and collecting uh, phytoplankton uh, samples building on their second year of data collection. In fact, they sent we had a little connection this morning. I'm going to share this little video right now. Hey Joe, it's Sinovan Hilda calling from the most amazing area. Um, we've had so much wind and we took the snowmobile out to, the, to where we saw the polar bear and the cub last year. It is so beautiful right now. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. I can only imagine. And Joe. We get to see this little video today. I yeah. know. And Hilda, um, what, what are we seeing in the background? Yeah, the background is a, is a glacier called the Reshesher Glacier. And it's, and actually we also saw the sun for the first time today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can see the incredible area uh, that they are. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, looks just beautiful. And they were connecting via satellite technology, which is the theme uh, of today's call. So it was great to, to be able to chat with them a little bit this morning. And let's cross our fingers here. I'm going to bring them into the stream live. They are joining us uh, in Bumsabu. The connect there. Yeah. You're just on mute, Hilda and Sinova. Can you unmute for me? All right, the connection doesn't always let us uh, uh, connect uh, with video, but some days we get a nice, we get lucky. So we just saw them. There they are, they're back again. Uh, Hilda and Sinova, if you can hear me, can you unmute your microphone? And we'll, we'll see if we can hear you via the call. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're here, sorry about that, Joe. We can hear you loud and clear. All right. Well, this is a treat. We don't often get to talk face to face like this. You are so far north. Polar bears are your closest neighbors. Sometimes the closest humans is the space station going above uh, you. So it's it's a treat to be able to see your faces today. Yeah, okay. Right you. back at you, Joe. All right. Well, give us an update. What's going on? What have you been up to? Well, we, um, as you just saw, we were out on a snowmobile trip today, um, and um, we went to the area where we saw this polar bear uh, last year. And this polar bear has a collar. Maybe you can show that picture, uh, Joe. It has a collar around the neck. And um, so she had a polar bear cub last year, which uh, was amazing to see. Unfortunately, unfortunately, she lost that cub uh, during July or during that spring. Uh, so when she came by here in July, she was uh, alone. Um, but uh, again, now she is in a den just south of here, and hopefully we will see her again uh, this spring with the new cubs. And uh, what else? We have uh, been using our snowmobile a little bit lately, and also skiing and, and long trips with Esther. But we went down to the shore the other day to pick up uh, to pick up some plastic, um, and uh, Esther was with us. Um, she was uh, at that time on a very very long leash, 
it's 15 meters, so she has a lot of space to run. And we were out down at the shore looking for plastic, and she saw a seal like 50 meters out in the open sea. And we're talking about open sea, but minus degrees in, in air temperature. And she just <laughs> jumped right out there after the seal, sort of hunting the seal. I don't think she even thought. Uh, I mean, who does that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and also we're, we're doing both citizen science work. We love working with you, Joe, and uh, we try to stay safe for polar bears. And I just, um, are we still coming in okay, Joe? Uh, you're coming through nice and clear with the audio, and yep, the video's still coming through. Okay, cool. Um, you know, we, well, you saw in the video that the light is coming back, and we're super excited about that, because that, that means two things. Um, one, our solar panel will start working again, um, and our windmill was broken for quite a few months, and it's been, it's been unbelievably windy here, like almost every day. That's all it does is blow. So um, we fixed our windmill, and we had the snowmobile as our anchor while we hoisted up this big windmill. You can't quite see it in the, back of the screenshot you have back there, but um, that was a big win for us. We are like, we can fix anything. Anything. Um, and we, when we went out on our snowmobile trip today, uh, we have to be prepared to walk back. So as far as we can ride, we have to be prepared to walk back. So we don't ever leave without our rifle, our safety gear, um, our Iridium satellite phone, and um, extra water and some snacks. So we are super ha happy and proud to, um, to have Marlink supporting this call and supporting our data because you know, without that, we would not connect with students, educators, all of our science partners, uh, and and beyond. Um, so Marlink, it, it truly, their tagline above and beyond. Uh, we're super happy to have Jessica with us today, and I can't believe we're we're live. We want to introduce you to our favorite furry friend. Here's Ezra. Can you see Joe? <laughs> yeah, let me bring it up uh, full screen. I just have to take my screen share down. There we go. Hey, Etra. She's looking good. There we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and thank you, Jessica. We're so happy to be on the call with everybody today. Thank oh. you both. All right. Well, I'm going to tuck you backstage temporarily. Don't go anywhere. We'll have some Q&A soon. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our guest today. So we have... Uh, Jessica Demar joining us today. She has more than 15 years experience in satellite communications industry. Uh, she started her career with former German and French national si uh, satellite communication agencies. And she is currently the chief marketing communications officer at Marlink. So making her the most senior uh, woman in the organization. So she's fluent in German, French, and English. She likes to keep busy with things like yoga, tennis, worldwide travel. Uh, and she's coming to us from Germany today. So let me bring Jessica live into the call. Hi, Jessica, how you doing? Hi there, I'm <laughs> doing fine, thank you. I hope oh, I, wish I would have a nicer background such as the one of Hilda and Sunny, yeah. well, mine's a bit messy there, but. <laughs> well, it's, it's a little unfair. They've got mountains and glaciers, yeah. and so it's hard to compete with that. Well, we are sitting in the cellars, yeah, that's not. Yeah. And what a nice, uh, what a nice surprise today! The video can be tricky from that far north, but that that's a nice video connection today. Yeah, yeah, I think you know they they did really well. I'm very proud that it worked so fluently. It's not always the case, I have to say, you know, but it's really it it went really well, I have to say. Also, voice quality, you know, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Jessica, let's uh, let you take over for a little bit and take us into the yeah. world of of global communications. Let me just. Start sharing my screen. Have a little preparation for you. I don't want to make it long because, like, you know, oh, where's the application gone now? Hang on one more time. That's okay. Sometimes it's sometimes technology takes one or two go. Yeah. I'm sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, this is one more time. Worked before, so it should be okay. Nope, one more time, sorry for that. That's okay, we'll get it going. Here we go. There we go, I see it loading up now. You see the screen now? Want me to blow yep. it up? Yeah, let's go full screen. Okay, let's go. All right, 
So, yeah, it's nice to be here today, you know, and uh, I think, you know, what else? I cannot give a better introduction than, than Hilda Sinua, to be honest, because like, you know, they told you or well, they showed you already the basics of satellite communications and what satellite communication is about, you know, they're the, they're the best proof in a way. So as you mentioned, my name is Jessica. I'm working for the company Marlink uh, for quite a while already now. I'm based in Europe, so more far away, you know, from, from you guys up there. And uh, yeah, I'm working for this company for quite a while. I'm happy to be here today to tell you a little bit about satellite communications. And again, you know, we are proud to, to support Hearts in the Ice because I think it's a very important project, uh, given that, yeah, as you said, Joe, the, the climate's not stopping that change. So it's important that we really rely on people such as Hild and Sunivar to give us a more understanding of what's happening up there. And uh, the way they communicate, as you've seen nicely in the in the little pictures up there, you know, they are sitting in a, in a wooden hut up in Bamsebu. And uh, as you've seen probably also in the picture, there is no connection. There is no fixed line. There is no uh, kind of a, a, a LGE line or something like that. So they absolutely depend on one thing, which is the satellite communications part. So they cannot just say, well, I'm going to be in the internet or I'm placing a phone call although you've seen uh, really nicely what kind of phone they're using. So they're really dependent on what we provide to them. And again, it's an honor for us to support them. But let me tell you a little bit more about satellite to introduce a bit. And I don't want to make it complicated because I think, you know, uh, it's it's very clear again on what's the, what's the benefits as we've just seen. So satellites, what are they? You know, and I think maybe some of you um, have seen models of satellites. I doubt that, you know, um, you've seen a real satellite, but... It's a kind of clever machines, I would say, uh, in different sizes out in the orbit, which can send and receive signals. And the fact that they send and receive signals make them very important to really transfer data, transfer communication, again, whether on email, whether on the phone. They're really, really central to our daily life. They're far away. They're circling around in the orbit, and I'm going to have a slide on that later. Same time, really, they are kind of keeping us connected down here so they really play a role in our daily communications there's different kind of satellites you know and uh, again um, even though we don't see them they're up there they again play an important role one thing which is important you know like here in Suniga we're just mentioning what they are using is a telecommunications satellite and you see the picture here of the people in the plane I mean for those of you who have ever of course you know been in the plane um, you can imagine that you cannot use your mobile phone and that you cannot send an email quickly. So the only way you know you can communicate is there through satellite. And sometimes you see planes who have that little bubble on top, which is a satellite receiver unit. And then the whole plane is actually connected um, through satellite. And then the people can use that service on board to check the emails, to work, as these people here do there to send emails, to even receive phone calls, but that's only possible because that plane, that specific plane is linked to the satellite. But it's a similar situation as Hild and Sunovain, obviously with them being in a wooden hut. And then other satellites, we call them the broadcast satellites, they are used to transfer news. Or you see the picture here, you know, news for TV and radio broadcasting, you know, whether it's on specific sports events, or, you know, you see the nice picture here of a running event, you very often see the journalists standing in front of the of the event with their microphones talking about what's happening in the back. And that is also transferred over satellite because they need to do it live and on the spot. And then on top of that, there's the navigation and GPS satellites. Uh, yeah, for most of them being in a car, you know, using a car or seeing where the parents want to drive to. And, you know, if they don't know the exact destination, they're absolutely 100 percent, you know, dependent on having the navigation system being used. And also that signal, the GPS signal is transferred over satellite. And there's also the reason when sometimes we're in a tunnel that we cannot see when we're passing a tunnel on the street that we cannot get the satellite. Sometimes the navigation goes flat because the satellite system, or the satellite signal is lost. And once you leave the tunnel again, obviously the satellite works perfectly again and shows you the proper direction. And then last but not least, we all want to know in the morning whether we have to wear a sweater or a woolly hat or something like that. Uh, and here also satellite plays a very important role because they're used for scientific and weather data and transfer. And here also, I think, you know, one more time coming back to Hearts and the Ice, 
the way um, Hilda and Studium are transferring the data is very, very important also for scientific purposes. So it's good to have them up there. What are we doing as Marlink? You know, what's our job? Uh, not on my own, of course, the whole company, um, as we, you know, learned a bit now about the, let's say, the basics of satellite. We are providing satellite communications to non-connected um, people and assets around the globe, whether they are in the maritime, so at sea, or on land. At sea, um, to give you one example, uh, when you've been probably on a cruise vessel or you've been maybe in the lucky situation to be on a yacht or even, you know, seeing the container vessels passing by, they cannot be connected to fixed line, of course. And they also are very often away from the typical GSM systems. So the only way to keep them connected is over satellite and hence the reason why most of the cruises cruise vessels or most of the transportation vessels have these big bubbles, kind of big white red domes, where the satellite, where, they, where the receiver unit is, um, it's not the satellite, but the receiving unit is hiding underneath. And that little unit allows them to communicate over the satellite. Or also mega yards, as I mentioned before, also oil rigs. And on the land side, you know, we also support um, non-governmental and help organizations. For instance, if there's a disaster somewhere on earthquake, and there is no more terrestrial connectivity, they are really dependent on that we support them with phone communication or email communication, internet access, et cetera. But also, you know, um, especially during the time of COVID now, um, you know, if you consider, you know, um, the container vessels for transporting our goods, sometimes it takes them weeks or I mean, even sometimes, you know, more than weeks um, to transfer the ocean, for instance. Let's say you would like to send um, a parcel from Canada to Europe. It's transported with a, with, a, with a container vessel. Then on board the container vessel, there are people working there and they stay weeks and weeks on board the vessel. And to also take care that they can get connected with their families and place a phone call home or send an email home or also use social media, we also provide satellite connectivity to them because it's incremental that they can stay connected also on board and keep in touch with their with their families and friends. So how are satellites, you know, I mean, they're up there in the orbit, but how do they get there? Very simple. Yeah, and a nice picture to the right. We use rockets. So that's not, so it's, it is about rocket science this time. So the rockets, let's say, put the, the satellite up there, up there in the orbit, it unfolds and starts, you know, connects with the Earth, and then it's getting managed from the Earth, and up there it starts at work. And to you can imagine that, you know, uh, a satellite, um, a telecommunication satellite for communication purposes is a pretty complex high engineering piece. So it takes up to three years to design and build it, and then sending it up is a couple of days and weeks. Up there it unfolds and starts at work. It's a very costly thing, such a satellite, because the typical cost of a satellite, you know, is around 150 to 250 million, you know, um, and that's not including the launch of that. And today they, you know, well, that's this figure from March 2020. They reckon that out there in the orbit, there's more than 5,000, to be precise, that's the number of the UN for March 2020, 5,074 satellites orbiting the world, orbiting our globe. And they definitely, as I mentioned before, they vary in terms of the size and the function. They can be sometimes small as a shoebox or as big as a house, depending on what they need to do. And how do we, how is it possible that they really transfer and receive the data and transfer it back onto the Earth? Well, they, they follow the orbit of the Earth. They circle the world, they circle our planet. And the way they're kept up there is obviously through gravity. And we differentiate between high altitude satellites, so meaning these are satellites which are far away from the Earth, sometimes up to 36,000 kilometers. And obviously the far they are, the more it takes them, the longer it takes them to follow that and to really do one circle around the world. And then there's also what we call the lower orbit satellites, which are coming closer to the Earth you know, for instance, um, there's the International Space Station satellite, which is 400 kilometers away, which is pretty close, actually, in, in space, in space meters, if I may say. And that, you know, a circle of the Earth also on the orbit, and it, it only takes it 90 minutes. 
So it really very much depends, you know, on what kind of satellite you need, what kind of satellite we're talking about. They're either far away or they're very close. And depending on the distance, it takes them more time to circle the world. And, you know, I think, you know, most of you have heard about it. It's like this is a, this is a satellite, which is an artificial satellite. But sometimes we also call the moon, which is following the Earth or circling around the Earth, a, a satellite. But it's not a satellite. It's a technical satellite. It's not an artificial satellite. It's actually a natural satellite because it is there without us sending it up into the orbit. Now, you know, Cinema and Hilda showed us very nicely how, how satellite communication works. And again, it's not, you know, even though it is put up there with a the rocket, it's actually pretty simple. If I may, you know, show it to you in this very simple way. Obviously, it is high level engineering in the back, but the way a data is really sent from, um, from a signal up to the satellite and down, it's really easy, it's really easy to illustrate, if I may say. So let's imagine um Cinema and Hilda. Um, want to send uh, a picture of the polar bear. So what they do, you know, um, they use the, the, the satellite device, they use the, they use the device they have on, uh, in the hut and thumb spoon. They want to send the email. So that little package, that little data package, that little um, yeah, email is then transferred up to the satellite and down again. So our lander station receives it. Oops, sorry. Sends it up to the satellite. The satellite gets the signal in a super fast way, by the way, super, super fast, because if you can imagine like, you know, when you normally send an email over a Wi-Fi connection or a terrestrial connection, it's done and, you know, out within seconds. Up here it takes slightly longer, but still very fast. Then from there, the satellite, uh, the signal is, you know, the, or the data package, let's say the email is transmitted back to the Earth. It's received there. And sometimes maybe you've seen that big, big satellite dishes, which are very often in very remote areas, because it's huge, massive satellite lander stations, which are receiving and sending the, the signals. And from there, it continues on. For instance, again, if Sunny Van Hilde want to send an email, it continues on to the scientific station or maybe to their homes, so that people receive the email down there. And that that the area where the where the satellite is active, you know, where the satellite can receive the signal is called its footprint. And as you have, as I mentioned before, we have 5,000 satellites around the orbiting the, the world. Every satellite has its footprint to really say that is deceiving, that is the resending, and then they can send it on. So that's really a clear area of responsibility for a satellite, to be honest. So again, coming back, how does it work now for hearts and the eyes? Again, the example you see to the left, the, the Bamsabu, the heart and Bamsabu. You know, Suniver and Tilda would like to send um, a data again, or maybe a picture to, to Instagram, which is also very important because you want to feed your social media channel. They send it to a satellite communication. It goes up to the satellite rather fast. It goes down again to a lander station. You know, there's a picture of a lander station in Norway, by the way, by the way, where you see the big satellite receiving units that receive the signal and then they send it over, in this case, for instance, to the classroom. As you've just seen how they um, been connected to us over email, that's exactly the way it worked. You know, they're sitting in the in the bumps of your heart. They've sent the video signal or the videos up, the satellite, trans um, the satellite receives it, sends it back down and just broadcasted it to us a second ago. So we're really proud to support Hearts and the Ice, as I mentioned before, because it's really, really important. I think you know, Cinema and Hilda do a great job there to really help us to understand the, the yeah, the, the, the So, you know, so um, then being on the phone, that they can do calls back home, that they can uh, do calls with their, with their colleagues. And that's very, very vital for them. Again, in the video before, we saw how they're using the Iridium handset. Um, it's also important that they really can send email and data and access the internet, you know, for instance, for our, for our nice session now. It's also important that they can do the video conferencing, as we've just seen a second ago. So that's something we are, you know, using it for as well. And last but not least, which is something which is a specific device. I mean, you can imagine when you're up close to the Arctic there and you are, you know, in that hut and something happens in terms of, you know, there would be an accident or you need any medical help. 
Then it's also important um, that you can, you know, use the telemedicine device. And we've provided to, to the two of them a kind of little box, which is uh, having some yeah, basic medical equipment in there. And also a transmitter unit, which allows them then from there to really um, access, you know, their doctor. This is not the doctor in the picture. This is just any doctor, but they have a, a doctor which they're using. And to get some advice from that doctor over video on, for instance, if they had an accident, what to do next? You know, how can they help? You know, how can they really get, you know, um, restored? And what kind of measures should they take? And that is very, very vital for them because, Again, imagine you would be up in the north there on your own and something is happening that's so important that they can really use the telemedicine box for health and to keep health, you know, in that remote area. And that's what we're providing them for. So the satellite phone, we provide them with email data, web browsing, video conferencing and health monitoring and telemedicine. And that's a nice package to keep them connected and safe up there. So that's you know, important for, because again, you know, satellite connectivity for them is a kind of lifeline. That already brings me to the end of the presentation because I think, you know, we don't want to make it too long, but hopefully it gives you um, a kind of a glimpse of what satellite communications is about and how it helps Sunne van Hilde up there in the, in the ice. Happy to take any questions, of course. Just stop the presentation. All right. Well, Jessica, thank you for that great presentation. You really made it simple to understand, you know, what satellites are, what they're doing and, you know, how they got there. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. That was great. So we're going to meet some of our classrooms now. So those who are tuning in via YouTube, uh, feel free to use that chat sidebar to say hi uh, and to send in a question. Uh, we've got some great classrooms joining us on camera who are going to fire some questions our way shortly. And Hilda and Sonova are back on satellite phone with me right now. Can you hear me, Hilda and Sonova? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. And we're trying to pop back in um, with, the, uh, with the video, actually. We're on now. Okay. Let me see if I can see you. Jessica, yep. that was fantastic. Thank you, Jessica. We, were, we, we would like to show like to oh, Okay, there you are. Hi. Hi. Um, this is that uh, telemed that Jessica was, was talking about, which uh, is our remote uh, emergency medical station. Fantastic. Very cool. All right. Well, students, everything is fair game right now. Questions for Jessica about satellite technology, questions for Hilda and Sunova about what they're doing, uh, life at Bumsabu and Svalbard. So let's uh, let's start bringing in some students. So we've got Miss Oaks joining us in Minnesota. She's got some fourth graders uh, hanging out with her virtually. Let's bring Miss Oaks in. Hey, Miss Oaks, how are you? Oops, Miss Oaks, can you grab the mute for me? She's at home. Oh, I think you hit it twice, Miss Oaks. <laughs> it came on, then right back off again. Now, oh, Miss Oaks, I don't know what's going on. I see it come on, and then there. Oh, no, it went again. Is there. it on now? Yeah, now it's holding. Sweet. All right. Uh, we have lots of questions. Um, Excellent. We uh, had several questions about how far can a satellite be? Um, could there ever be like satellites orbiting the moon or other planets? Um, is there like a limit to uh, satellite technology? Yeah, I take that one. Hello, Sai. So um, at the moment, it's the, 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 the satellite, which is the farthest away, is the geosatellite. And that's, uh, as I mentioned before, 36,000 kilometers. There's no satellites at the moment, you know, and maybe future, you know, but there's no satellite at the moment, you know, orbiting the moon or orbiting other planets. That's the most far away is the 36,000 kilometer one. And that's the farthest as we can reach at the moment. Okay, great question. Uh, get... Yeah, definitely. Great question to get us started. Uh, let's see. Let's jump to another live group. So uh, Mr. Chin's class is joining us from Markham uh, in Ontario, Canada some grade eight students. I'm gonna pop them up on camera here. There they are. How are we doing grade eight? Hello. 
Um, so I had a question. What happens to satellites in space that don't work anymore? C can you read that one more time? What happens to satellites? What happens to satellites in space that don't work anymore? Ah, yeah, the so-called satellite garbage, we call it, or satellite trash, if you want to call it like that. It depends, you know, those were, you know, which are really far away, the one I was referring to before. What they do, I mean, they're always monitored from the Earth. So there's always a control center taking care that they're not doing stupid things up there. So what is happening, you know, the engineers is kind of, you know, once it's old and out there, it slows it down because there is the rest of the fuel of the satellite to slow it down. And then, you know, they kind of drop it back into the out of the orbit and it kind of dissolves, it disappears in the atmosphere. And those satellites which are slightly closer, um, you know, the, sorry, those who are, which are even more far away, sorry, wrong one, you know, they are put outside of the orbit. So it's like they try to they try to avoid as much trash as possible. But as you can imagine, there's tons and tons of kind of almost dead satellites circling the Earth. So they try to really even put them more out in the orbit or put them back in, you know, so that they're dissolved in the in the atmosphere. All right. Another great question. Um, I want to grab one from YouTube. And Hilda and Cinema, this is one that you might be able to speak to. Um, do you find that the weather conditions affect your connectivity? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I'm not sure if that's correct, but that's how we uh, how we um, understand it. We um, we off we've had hurricane um, storms here, especially last year, and we did notice that on those days it was really really difficult for us to stay connected uh, longer than maybe 20 30 seconds yeah jessica can you touch on that a little bit uh, yeah i can confirm the weather unfortunately you know it plays a role i mean it's definitely you know depends on you know the elevation as a lot of multiple let's say you know factors to to influence that but yes you know it does affect uh, definitely the quality of the transmission so it's not only the, the sound, you know, imagine like Hale and Suniva picking up the phone is the wind there, but it's also the, 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 the coverage, you know, so because if you mentioned before that satellite footprint, you know, down to the earth, if it is disturbed uh, because of bad weather conditions, it can definitely have an effect, yeah. So okay. happy that, you know, the, the quality is actually that good for your weather conditions up there, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have a group joining us. Where did they go? There we go. Uh, they're joining us uh, in Maryland, some sixth graders. It looks like four classrooms who are tuning in, and then they have a station set up where they can come and ask some questions. So I am going to bring that station in now. All right, we've got a question. How did Hilda and Suniva get to where they are? Oh, great question. Um, that is a great question, actually. We're founded by um, um, a fjord and uh, the open sea, not too far away from us. So to get, you would need to actually fly to Norway, um, inland Norway, and then you would need to take an airplane from uh, either Oslo or Tromsø to get to the town of Longyearbyen, uh, which is a settlement in Svalbard. And then from there, uh, how we got here was uh, with a ship. It took us 10 hours to get here by boat. Um, and the seas are very, very rough. It's, uh, it's quite an expedition, actually, to get to us. Another option is to take the snowmobile. Um, last year, when we left in May to get some provisions, we actually took a, what was it, about eight hours it took us? Seven, seven eight hours by snowmobile to get from here to long it been, but you have to have the right uh, conditions, and you're crossing over some glaciers, and it's a pretty hardy trip. All right. Great question. Let's head to San Diego. Probably a tiny bit warmer than Svalbard. Uh, with Miss Becker, how are you doing? Oh, great. Good morning. It's lovely to see all of you. Yes, it is a, a, a balmy, you know, 67 degrees here. So I'm very sorry <laughs> to let you know that. But good weather is coming to us all. Uh, we would like to know about the, the, the litter and what happens to satellites and rockets. They're going into space when they break down. Do they disintegrate? How does that affect the, the uh, galaxy litter, so to speak? 
Yeah, I think, you know, if, if I understood well, it's like, you know, it's more about the trash again, so that, you know, what what, what happened with them up there? Or did I understand that question well? Yeah, I think, you know, we hear stories recently about there's more and more accumulating and, you know, it could make it harder to launch in the future to to, to do successful launches. To, to, I have to say, I'm, I'm not so much familiar with that one, to be honest. Like, you know, I can't answer that question to all detail. You know, it's a bit, um, yeah, I heard that also, you know. So uh, our engineers, you know, maybe, you know, they need to look into that a bit more. But, you know, it's a question I can't really answer 100%, uh, you know, to be honest, because, like, it's more more for the, we're not launching them. We are more, you know, using the satellite for, for connectivity. So we're not a kind of satellite network operator in a way. So it's a bit of a difficult question, you know, to answer. And I don't want to say anything wrong. All I know, again, you know, from, from what we know today is the fact that, you know, again, old satellites are kind of trashed in the orbit. And that's something, you know, we have to, um, I think also the satellite network operators have to take much more care about going forward. And then I think we know that they know, but what they do with that is, you know, a bit, you know, difficult to say for me, um, because again, this, this is the responsibility of the manufacturer of the satellites. Yeah, no, absolutely. And definitely something, a little homework we can give our classes to research a little bit more, because I know, you know, there are some organizations working on are there ways to repair uh, or refuel satellites in orbit to extend their life? So um, yeah, I think exactly. there's a lot of cool things going on in that world. Yeah, and also on the rockets, because you saw very often, you know, you heard probably already that, you know, uh, there's the new space link, you know, so that they're thinking about refueling that and you're using that, which is great because they recycle also the rockets in a way. So, uh, and the spaceships, which is something, you know, which is important. Uh, so I'm sure that they also learn more and more about what sustainability needs to be about uh, and that they, they, they will apply to that, yeah. All right, uh, let's see, where do we have to go? Miss Michael's crew, they are fourth graders in Glenview, Illinois. Let's bring her in. Hey, Miss Michael. Hi, I have a couple of questions from Jaya who wants to be an engineer. So Jaya, take, Give it a try. Um, so, um, uh, where did my gosh? Um, uh, how, um, what does a satellite use to find its way around? And, like, if there's an object, how does the satellite know not to hit it and, like, so destroy it or something happen to it? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, you would think, you know, with all the tons of satellite up there that they can easily crash even into each other, you know. So they are still monitored from the Earth. So, you know, maybe sometimes you see that in movies when they launch the, the rockets, that there's always a kind of control center. And that control center obviously also takes good care of the satellite. On top of that, the satellite itself has a kind of protection system around so that it knows how to, how to really maneuver around that. But the way it's kept up there, it's really through the orbit and through the gravity. So they have a certain satellite path, if I may say, which they continuously keep the circle. And the only way they have to distract a little bit is when there's a manual intervention again from, you know, let's say uh, from the Earth, where they really say, okay, there's another object coming, and then they maneuver that around. But they always need to be controlled. They are up there on their own, but the way they're controlled is from the Earth. Okay, great questions from our group so far. Uh, let's go back to Maryland. I can see that someone else is waiting in the hallway for us. Um, I have a so I have a question for Suniva and Hilda. Go for it. Um, so if have they ever had to walk back, and if they have had to walk back, how far have they had to walk? Um. I'll take, I'll, great question. Um, we actually did have, uh, thankfully not today, but we did have a little incident. Um, it was last year, actually, because we've been here 15 months now, and we had really, really deep snow. Remember that, Hinda? And the snowmobile um, got stuck in the deep snow, and we 
we couldn't actually shovel ourselves out, so we had to walk back to Bumsabu. And, you know, it sounds like it's a kind of a stroll where you can whistle and it's an easy, you know, walk back, but the snow was deep. And we wear a lot of clothing, heavy boots, uh, heavy snowmobile suits, heavy helmets. So it was, uh, it was a little bit of a trek, but we got more uh, shovels and then I went back and got home. And it was uh, because we had a big log hanging behind our snowmobile. We were picking up some uh, driftwood on the beach uh, to have uh, a way. It yeah. could be a long distance or it could be short. All right, so, fair enough. Prepared. Great question. Uh, let's bounce around a little bit. Uh, Mr. Chin's crew, grade eights, do you guys have another question? <laughs> Here comes someone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, bud. Okay, uh, how long does it take to build a satellite? Yeah, it depends on the size uh, of the satellite and what kind of satellite you need, you know? So if you say, you know, it's a very complex satellite because they all have, as I mentioned, like different um, tasks to fulfill. So on average, they say around three years. Around about three years. Again, if it's a smaller one, then it may take shorter. But if it's really one of the bigger ones, then, you know, around three years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's pretty cool. You know, I think a lot of students might think of satellites, you know, really large with the big solar panels, but they're starting to build smaller ones um, that they can launch a little more efficiently um, yeah. and bring the cost down too. Bring the cost down, avoid collision and all that. Or as there's more and more up there, you know, the smaller they are, the more powerful they're also getting these days. So that's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Miss Oaks, do you have another question for us? Hey, uh, yeah, yeah Hilton Cinema. Yeah, just uh, we just wanted to mention um, what's so amazing about being so far north with absolutely no, you know, no pollution, no traffic, no not no light pollution. The sky is so clear and it's been so dark for three months. We have seen many, many satellites. We'll often just stand outside when we're taking Aurora photography and, and uh, watch the satellites. It's like this little, um, uh, like they're like little moving stars. I mean, it's just an absolutely phenomenal thing to, to watch. Very cool. Yeah, and, and the ice ice is pretty close, 400 kilometers. That's the one you can see very often, you know, because it circles every 90 minutes. And it's really, you know, you, you seem to think it's, it's a kind of moving star, you know, depending on where you are. But it's really actually the ISS, you know, so that's, yeah, it's almost like as if you can grab it from the sky as close as that. <laughs> All right. Miss Oaks, do your fourth graders have another question for us? Yeah, we have a question. Um, how many signals can a satellite um, handle at once, um, down, you know, downlinking and uplinking? And how does it keep all the different signals separate? Yeah, it's a good one. So I think, you know, I, there's no there's no definite number of how many it can. It depends on the size of the signal, on the size of the package you're sending up and down. So, but everyone, every kind of little signal has its own kind of, um, how can I say, kind of um, slot in a way. So it really finds its way, it parks more or less, you know, it goes up, it parks, it goes down again. But, you know, depend. It, it's difficult to say, you know, how many exactly, because it really depends on what you want to transfer, whether it's a voice communication or whether it's a bulky email, you know, it finds its way up and down. But, you know, it's there's no kind of exact figure to say that's the amount of, of, of signals it can receive. It can vary from the from the from the from the weight of the package you're trying to send. But it finds its way because it's really designated, you know, to the satellite up and down. All right. I love these questions. The students are obviously very curious. Uh, lots of engineering questions coming your way, Jessica. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Miss Michael uh in illinois um emma had a question emma go ahead can satellites see parts of space or just earth i think you know to be honest that's a very good question you know i need to check this back with my engineers but like you know i think you know they can they mostly as they kind of you know focus down to the earth i think they're too far they're not too close to the other planets i don't think you know they they possibly can see that we don't have a camera on the on the satellite itself to view that 
we see the satellite bit, we cannot have a camera on it. But um, it's a very good question. And I think, you know, we should possibly, I guess, you know, they are able to see other planets from very remote, but the Earth, they see definitely, you know, so that's the what, that's the closest one then. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it kind of comes down to, you know, there's things like the Hubble telescope, Mm -hmm. they consider that a, a satellite or you know because it has a different job but i guess because it's orbiting you could consider it uh yep. to be a satellite yeah very cool and for those tuning in the james webb space telescope is launching soon and that is going to be a, a pretty mm -hmm. wild uh, telescope and show us lots of amazing things kind of looking outwards um without the atmosphere uh affecting the view very cool uh san diego miss backward you guys have one more question for us Yes, Jessica, we were wondering what sort of pathway did you follow and how did you know that this would be your ultimate job? <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, yeah, that's a good one. I think, you know, I started in the telecommunications with a local normal, let's say, provider. So like a mobile, a mobile provider. And then I found the satellite part much more interesting because you would think that you know, um, the world is connected wherever you are, but, you know, actually it's not the case. And then I found that the fact that, you know, that there's still satellite communications around. I thought like, I, I go to that area because the telecommunications company I was working with was providing GSM connectivity, internet, like, like we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. But that bit on satellite, I found it more interesting than anything else because I was always sure that, yeah, no one needs that. And then I was surprised how many people need that. And, you know, from well, the Hearts and the Ice uh, team, for instance, it's such an important lifeline. And then I thought, like, it's the best, you know, it's actually that's the nice bit of it because it brings it brings people, uh, it's used by people in a situation where there's nothing else. And hence, I thought, like, I, I joined that part of the company and that proved the right way to be because GSM and, and Internet, I think everyone can do that, but not necessarily on a satellite. And this is what makes it interesting. But if you want to start a career on that, either be an engineer or, you know, go with a with a satellite communications company to, to find out more. It's interesting. Thank All you. Right. Great question. So I'm going to jump back to our school in Maryland because I know there's four classrooms. So I want to make sure uh, they get represented. So go ahead and ask your question. How long does it... Uh... How difficult is it to communicate with the satellite? You mean for like, you know, when you take when you take the phone, for instance, and you want to communicate, do you use a satellite phone? Or oh, yeah. do you, I think maybe uh, more just like sending yeah. out a signal to do yeah. something, telling it what to do. Communicate with the satellite itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 you know, of course, it requires high engineering, as I mentioned, but it's like, it, you know, the, the lander station sends the signal up and down. So for them, it's pretty, for the satellite itself and the lander station itself, it's pretty easy because they, you know, they, they are designed in a way that they can really receive and send it up down very quickly, within seconds, actually, you know. So it's you, you've seen from Hild and Suniva that there was not a lot of delay because normally you would think that there's a lot of delay because of the it has to go up and down again. But the fact that it's, you know, almost like life shows us that it's really simple to go up and down, you know, even though I would say from a, from a purely technical point of view, it's a very highly engineering job to design a satellite and also to design the devices to, to receive it. But the signal itself has an easy pass and a fast pass. All right. And then I see someone behind you. Do you want to pop up and ask your question quick? Is it possible for a satellite to have the same flight path as another satellite? Is it possible for the satellite to have the same? Sorry? Yes. Is it possible yeah, the, for the, the same flight path, path as another satellite? At the same path? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's like, you know, they're, sometimes they're following out, for instance, the Iridium network, you know, um, to give you one example, when you saw the, the movie before, you know, they were using the satellite handset that's an Iridium phone. And there's lots and lots of satellites, you know, they spend around the world like a little net and they follow each other. So they're taking the exact same path again and again and again and again, but just following each other, you know, and they take the exact same path. So they're, they're never on the spot at the same time because then obviously there would be a collision and, you know, they they have their own little footprint. But they follow each other like little tracks, you know, but they take the same path, if I may say. Yeah. 
All right. Let me, there we go, change that view. Let's check for one more question in the chat. Where is it? There we go. Um, okay. So Jessica, this is a question for you. One more. Uh, Hilda and Seneva are gonna call in in just one moment uh, for the wrap up, but what's the favorite part of your job, uh, Jessica? Favorite um, being creative. I like to I like to um, write and uh, be creative. So that's the that's the nice part of it. Writing is something complicated um, because I like communication is kind of complicated. But putting it in a way that people understand that that's the favorite part of my job. I would say. All right, awesome. So we're just trying to load uh, Hilda and Sudva one more time for a face-to-face -face goodbye. So I see that the, the wheel is turning. Maybe, maybe. Let's see. If we get, Sigma now. <laughs> let's see if we get lucky today. Oh, there they are. Yay! Oh, yeah. So Hilda and Sudva, we just asked Jessica what the favorite part of her job is. What's your favorite thing about what you're doing? Oh, that's a great question. So I'll put Hilda on the spot first. I mean, this was, I've been a dream to me uh, for the last, at least 25 years, to do an overview here uh, at, at Svalbard, high Arctic, close to the North Pole. So I think just to be immersed with that beautiful nature, with a wildlife that is so special, with the light and with the lack of light and just be part of something so much bigger than us and be able to talk to you guys out there um, following our mission to try to uh, uh, be involved in the dialogue around climate change um, and be helping citizen scientists or our citizen scientists um, with DARPA to the scientists. That, I mean, all that is, um, is the best part of our stay, I think. Or our job. I think um, some of uh, the favorite parts of uh, my job are uh, uh, just being here, being like completely remote. Uh, a lot of people out there are living in isolation, and so are we, but we're surrounded by nature, like you just said. And you know, um, we are not 20 years old anymore, as you can tell, but we are. We are passionately curious, and I think what I love about what we're doing right now is absolutely these phone calls with you, Joe, and experts like Jessica from Marlink. Um, it's the ability for us to com continually peel back the layers and to understand how how interconnected all of us are as people and how interconnected everything is in our world, including satellites and, you know, wildlife and people. And it's just an amazing web of magic to have you live in and in it every day. All right. Very cool. Well, uh, again, so good to see both of you uh, for such a long period today. That's so great. Um, thank you for that video at the beginning. Oh, thank you, Molly. Yeah, thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. You're best, uh, the best reference now. It's the perfect signal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that little piece at the beginning, and congrats on the sun making an appearance, finally. That's yeah. amazing. Oh, that was a big, big thing today. And it's actually not appearing here at the hut until the 8th of March. But um, no, that was amazing. And Jessica... I'm sure Knut and Judith and maybe Joe is on the call uh, are warm and best regards to them as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, who you who you have as a as a partner, like a satellite partner, is so important because we don't have anybody to help us with anything. We're so far away, so we count on the Marlene team, and they could not be nicer. Um, it's just yeah. we have. I feel like if we lived closer, we would we would probably well for one we would take you out to dinner for sure, <laughs> but we would be friends. <laughs> All yeah. right, amazing. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube crew. Thank you for those tuning in today. Thank you for sending in those great questions. I'm going to just briefly pop in a few camera views here to thank our live classrooms, our virtual classrooms for joining us today. Thank you so much. Everybody, Thank you. Jessica, thank you. An amazing presentation uh, and introducing us to the world of satellite communication in such an easy, fun way. 
And Hilden Sunava, so good to see you as always. We can't wait for our next events uh, in March. And take good care of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.